31. Proverb 31. Verse 10 is where we're going to pick it up. This goes along with our topic that we're studying right now. Verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her so that he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like a merchant, the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it from her profits. She plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestries for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful. And beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands. And let her own works praise her in the gates. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. Thought about doing an exposition on this particular passage, but uh, I don't know if we can get past verse 15, where it says she gets up in the middle of the night to start her day. <laughs> she gets up early and goes to bed late. That's what part of what this uh, proverb says. And of course, I don't think that's uh, the intention is not to say there that uh, to be a virtuous wife, you got to get up before the sun does and you can't go to bed until the sun sets. I don't think that's what it's talking about. It's talking about her, her work as a wife and a mother. She's very devoted to her husband, to her children. She is not idle. She is productive, and she cares for her home. And uh, so very interesting and insightful uh, proverb there. Now, that goes along with our series on the family that we're doing right now. And uh, today we're covering the wife and mom, the wife and mom. So last week was the father, the husband and father, and this week is the wife and mom. And if there's any member of the family who is more subtly attacked than the husband and father, it has to be the wife and mother. Women have been sold a false bill of goods. False bill of goods in the definition of what is equality, the need for equality, and the necessity of equality. This bill of goods is a lie. And when we think about women today, we understand there's an incredible amount of pressure put on women. 
such things as these six examples of lies told to women. Lie number one, your body is your own. You can do whatever you want with it, including killing your unborn child. Lie number two, for you to have value in this life, you need to have a career. Lie number three is kind of the reverse of lie number two. Lie number three, or not, maybe not the reverse, the converse. Being a mother, staying at home to raise a family is not worth much. It might have some value, but it not as much value as being in the workforce. That's lie number three. Lie number four. You can do anything you set your mind to. Now, that's not just a lot of women. That's a lot of everybody. You can do anything you set your mind to, including everything that a man can do. That's a lie. Lie number five. You need to be independent so you don't have to rely upon anyone, including a husband. Lie number six. Don't do anything that will slow you down or stop you from fulfilling all of your dreams. So those are just six examples of the lies that women are told in general in our culture. There's many other things, but those are just six that I think really stand out. Furthermore, the lies of our culture have either been ignored or accepted by the church. We either ignore them, kind of just pass over them, we don't think about them, we don't warn about them, or in some cases, we have even accepted those lies. We don't pay attention to passages that inform us about the roles of women, wives, and mothers. We accept only the things that we want to hear. And we're afraid to say, too much, too much that somebody might find offensive because if you push this issue too hard, you're going to cause women to leave the church. And of course, the church is made up like 75%. I'm not talking about our church, but churches across America, 75% of the people who go to church are women. All the women leave, and you got a problem. So we're cautious. We're afraid about saying what the Bible says on the topic of women. Consider one of the effects that the lies of our culture has had. Okay, just consider this. This, is come, this comes out of the lies that our culture tells women. Our lies that are repeat, these lies that are repeated over and over. On average, people are marrying later in life. It's on average. The person most affected by this is the wife. This is because while she may have changed her mind and her attitude, her husband may change his mind and attitude about life and family. Their families and friends may have a different attitude towards life and family than what the Bible says. What they cannot change is how God has designed the body of a woman. As you know, a female ha is designed with a limited number of eggs. When these eggs are gone, there is no more possibility of having biological children. It's a limited number. And as I was looking at this this week, I looked at one source, and they said the optimal age for fertility is between 18 and 31. So that's the optimal age. It doesn't mean you can't get pregnant outside of that, but that's the optimal ages for fertility. Now, if a woman waits until her mid to late 30s or even her 40s to have children, she's not only decreasing her ability to conceive, but she's also increasing the probability of complications in the pregnancy. And while medical technology certainly has helped, helped 
in quotation marks, in this area, it still, not, it still cannot change how God has designed the body of a woman. The culture lies and says, go into the workforce, establish yourself in a career, put your family on hold. What they don't say along with that is the longer and longer you wait to have a family, the harder and harder it will become to have a family. And so the culture has lied. Now, this morning, there in your notes, you have the, the outline that we're going to go by here this morning. We have four headings that I want us to think about, that I want us to consider. Now, first, we're going to look at the creation and role of the woman. Okay, the creation and role of the woman. Secondly, we're going to look at the role of the wife and mother. The wife and mother. Thirdly, challenges. Of course, we're talking about challenges to the role of wife and mother. And number four, solutions. I'm going to offer some solutions to the challenges. We can't list all the challenges, nor can we list all the solutions. So, But we're going to at least start to think about these things a little bit here this morning. So... First, let's consider the creation and role of the woman, the creation and role of the woman. Uh, the reason we need to look at this is before we can understand about wives and mothers, we have to understand about women, about how God has created women. And I've simply chosen two uh, passages to be examples. There's plenty of other passages we could go to in the Bible that tell us something about women, about the creation, how God created them, but I've just picked two. got to limit yourself, and so I've limit, limited us to these two. So the first passage I want us to turn to is Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, particularly verse 18, verse 18 and 20. And there is a phrase that appears in both of these verses. It's the same phrase that is shared by both of these verses here this morning. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him, and here's the phrase I want us to think about, a helper comparable to him. You see this same phrase at the end of verse 20. At the end of verse 20. So I want us to think about this phrase. Uh, in this particular passage, we have the context of creation. Uh, God is making and building a companion for the man. Uh, the description of this companion is a helper comparable to him. A helper comparable to the man. When Adam named all the animals, he found that there was none that fits this description, thankfully. None of them fit this description. So God had to create a companion for the man from the man. So God created a companion for the man that came from the man himself. So what does it mean to be a helper comparable to the man? What's that mean? So we need to understand the two key words here, helper and comparable. The term helper comes from the Hebrew noun Ezar or Azar. Ezer. E Z E R. E Z E R. Understanding this word helps us know what the Lord is talking about here in the relationship between the woman and and the man. Now, this word "ezer" is not super common in our Bibles. It only occurs 17 times, and it really is occurs in 12 times outside of these two verses. 12 passages outside of these two verses. And so, this word "helper," "ezer," we find it in some names in the Bible. One of those names is Eli. Ezer. Eliezer. Eliezer. El. God. E. My. Ezer. Help. 
My God is help. My God is help. Or my God is my helper is the idea there. So that occurs all over, all over our Bible in different ways, different names. But this particular word, Ezer, it is most often used and connected to directly or indirectly with the work of the Lord as a helper for a person. That's how it's most often used. Let me give you an example of this. You don't have to turn there. Psalm 121. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? Question, that's a question mark. From where does my easer, my help, come from? My easer, my help, comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. So the Lord is referred to very often in our Bibles as the helper, as the easer. So what conclusion might we draw from this information? What conclusion can we draw from it? Uh, first, we have to see that this term easer, by the way, when you look at the verb form of this term, it occurs much more frequently and most often, it is connected to the work of God as well. So this term is most often used of God being a helper. Okay, Most often, this term, easer, is connected to God being the helper. Secondly, we can conclude that this term is about role and function and not about value. It's not about essence. It's not about who a person is, it is about what they do. In no way can we say that God is man's helper, therefore God is less than man. Doesn't work, does it? God is greater than man, yet God is still a helper. Now, let's think about those conclusions in light of Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 and 20. Here in this passage that's describing to us the creation, the building of a companion for the man. And she is said, she is described as a helper comparable to the man. So this term helper describes the role of the woman in relation to the man. The role of the woman in relation to man. Also, this term doesn't indicate that the woman is of any less value or less than the man. This is a term about role and function. It is not about value or the essence of her being. So to be a helper does not imply someone is less than. It does not imply that the woman is any way less than the man. It's talking about her role in relationship to the man. That's the word easer, helper. We also need to consider the term comparable, comparable. This is the Hebrew word neged, neged, N-E-G-E-D, neged. It's much more common than helper to appear some 152 times in the Bible. And it has the idea of opposite or mirror image. So, to be comparable, it's like standing, looking at a mirror, and you see a comparable image. It, it is, uh, think about this way, to be comparable, for the woman to be comparable to the man, it is she matches the man. No other animal was found to match the man. So God is going to create a companion that matches the man, that corresponds to his kind. And so we have to understand what it means to be uh, uh, comparable to what it means to be a helper. She is a helper comparable to the man. 
Now, with these two terms, helper and comparable, we find that there is a distinction between the man and the woman and a similarity. With the term helper, the distinction is in the role and function. The woman is going to have a different role and a different function in relation to the man. With the word comparable, we find that there is a similarity in kind and species and genus. There's a similarity there. Uh, the woman is not a different animal, mammal, whatever you want to say, than the man. She's exactly like his kind, but she is distinct in form. The woman is not going to be a man. She is not going to be like the man in many ways, but she is going to be the same kind as the man, as opposed to being some other kind of creature. So in Genesis 2, it's telling us that God created the woman to be like man and that they are the same species, they are the same kind, but that the woman's going to have a different role and a different function in her relationship with the man. So they're same but different. So Genesis 2 tells us a lot about women. Now let's turn over to our New Testament, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. Just understand, we've just skipped a lot of passages that talk about women in between Genesis and 1 Timothy. All right? So these are just examples. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14 says, Therefore I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, in the context here, Paul is addressing which widows are qualified to be supported or helped financially by the church. It's not the support and help of the widows is not a one-time gift. It, it is they get enrolled in the church help program and they re receive regular distributions from the church in order to help them live. And so Paul is laying out how does one qualify for this type of program from the church. And in verse 9, if you just look there in your Bible, in verse 9, we see that she has to be 60 or older. We also see that she has to have been faithful in her marriage. In verse 10, it goes on to explain she has to be known for her good works, which include raising children, lodging strangers, serving the saints, and helping the afflicted. Paul then explains, after he explains, how do you qualify for this support program? Paul then explains why younger widows don't qualify. And then he gives some instructions to these younger widows. Here's the instructions for the younger widows. Instruction number one, marry. Or we might say remarry, marry. Instruction number two, bear children. Instruction number three, manage the house. Instruction number four, give no opportunity for reproachment. In short, Paul says that the younger widows are to go back to being wives and mothers. Therefore, what he says here is instructive to us to see what wives and mothers ought to do, what they were created for. So notice the three roles or functions. Three roles or functions that women were created for as given in this verse. They are to marry. They are to be a wife. They are to be a wife. Number two, they are to bear children. They are to be mothers. They are to be mothers. And number three, they are to manage the house. Manage the house. They are to run the home. Literally, this word that we see here uh, in verse what verse are we in? 14, verse 14, where it says, manage the house. That's one word in Greek. 
And it's the word house ruler. House ruler. She is to run the house. Of course, this is all in the context of her being a helper comparable to the man, to her husband. So these verses tell us quite a bit, quite a bit about the role and function of women, how God created women. Now we need to consider, heading number two, the role of wife and mother, the role of wife and mother. So the wife and the mother is the primary support of the family, and therefore she is the primary support of society. So she's the main support and the main supporter of her husband. We learn that in Genesis chapter 2, where she is the helper comparable to him. That helper expresses her functional relationship with her husband. So this means by extension that the wife is not only the support for her husband, but she is also the primary support for society. Secondly, we see here that the wife and mother is to love her husband and children. Now we find this in Titus chapter 2 verse 4. Now we I left you in 1 Timothy. I left you in 1 Timothy, but in Titus chapter 2 verse 4 it says this, that they admonish the young women, that the older women admonish the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. So when you think about this verse, it presumes that the older women know how to do this, that the older women have learned how to love their husband and children. We also see that the younger women must be taught this, that word that they admonish, that's a teaching word, that they teach them. So the younger women must be taught how to love their husband and children. So the genuine love that a wife or a mother expresses to her husband and child is not something that comes naturally. Don't you think that's interesting? So all those warm, fuzzy, gushy feelings that women have when they get married and, you know, when they have babies and all that, okay, all that, uh, you know, those feelings of, oh, I just love this person, I just love this baby. That's not the type of love that's being spoken of here. All that comes naturally, but the, the love that is spoken of here doesn't come naturally. This comes after the baby grows up, does what it wants to do, after the baby's told, don't make a mess there, clean that up, and they don't, and they just look at you like you're from outer space. This is the love that the mother must have towards that baby. So she's told to... Loved. And I think it's very interesting. This is the only passage in the Bible, the only passage in the Bible where women are the subject of the verb love, where women are told to love. At every other place in the Bible where the word love in women occurs, women are always the one who is loved. Here, It's the opposite. Women are told to love their husbands and their husband and children. So this tells us something about how the older women and the younger women are to relate in the church. The older women are supposed to know and teach the younger women, and they are to teach them to love their husband and their children. Now, this is an important concept that we have to understand. Whose responsibility is it to teach the younger women how to relate properly to their husband and their children? Whose responsibility is that? The older women. The older women. So the role of wife and the mother here is to love. Thirdly, this is letter C now in your outline there. 
in relation to her husband in particular. So we've already mentioned how she is to be his supporter. We saw that in the term help in Genesis 2, 18 and 20. But we also see that she's told to submit, to submit to her husband. And so you have that list of verses there that starts with Ephesians 5 and goes all the way through 1 Peter 3. And each of those places is talks about a wife is to submit to her husband. By the way, submitting is an active word. Submitting is an active word, not a passive word. When the Bible speaks of a wife submitting to her husband, it never speaks of a wife being made to submit. It always speaks of a wife willingly, actively submitting. It is not the husband's job to make his wife submit. It is the wife's responsibility herself to submit. So she is to be a supporter. She's to be a helper and she is to be uh, submissive, to, be, to submit to her husband. By the way, that word submit actually means to line up under. Now, put that in a visual form, line up under. It gives you a word picture that would be the word picture of a support, doesn't it? Or a pillar underneath something that holds something up. This is the role of a wife in relation to her husband. She is equal to her husband, but she has a different role. Now let's think about the relationship to her children, a mother's relationship to her children. As we have already seen, she is to bear children. She is to have children. By the way, absolutely unique to females. Absolutely unique to females. Men cannot bear children. Can't bear children. So even in our culture, even in our culture where someone has invented the phrase, birthing person, birthing person. If you're a woman, you ought to be offended by that. There is no such thing as a birthing person. There is a mother who gives birth. That is a slight on women. To, to use that phrase is a slight on women. And it's an offense. And it should be treated with contempt. Women have the privilege, the responsibility, the God-given right and ability to bear children. So they're to bear children. Secondly, they are to raise children. Raise children. So mom is to teach your children. You teach them. You tell them what is right and wrong. You tell them, this is how you do it. Don't do it that way. Don't load the washing machine to the top with dirty clothes. You need some space for water. Okay? Don't do it. Do it this way. Do it this way. This is not clean. That's not clean. This is clean. And this is how you clean. That's mom's responsibility to raise her children, to teach them right and wrong. Thirdly, in relation to her children, mom is to rule the children, rule the children. Moms are a parent, not a peer. They are a parent and not a peer. You have authority over them. And this is such a, we get this so messed up today because when a parent does not establish the fact that they are the authority over their children, when their children go to school, they fail to recognize that other adults are also authorities over them. And then when there's a problem at school, I saw this on 
Facebook this week. When there's a problem at school, the parent sides with the child automatically instead of thinking there's more to the story than what I'm hearing. When you don't establish authority over your children, they will have a problem with authority in any other context. By the way, when you don't do this, by the time they're at least five or six, it's really hard. It's really, really hard after that. Um, <clears throat> so you are the parent. You are not a peer. Your child is not your best friend. They are not supposed to fill the role of your best friend. That's a relationship that is reserved for your husband. So the biblical view of a woman has been ignored and rejected and maligned in much of our culture. But even the honest secular social scientist can see that in reality, you can't go against the biblical model. When you go against God's design and God's instruction, you introduce problems and challenges into marriage and families that you don't need to have. There's already enough challenges without adding more into it. So if you want to be countercultural, if you don't want to go with the flow, follow what the Bible says about being a woman, a wife, and a mother. Support what the Bible says. Emphasize what the Bible says. Tell others about what the Bible says about these things. But even more importantly, if you want to be pleasing to the Lord, you need to do these things. So this is the role of a wife and mother. Now let's look at some of the challenges, some of the challenges here. So I got six challenges, only six. I've only listed six. <laughs> There's more, but I've only listed six challenges to the role of biblical of being a biblical woman, wife, and mother. Look, first one, number one. I listed this number one because it is number one. And that's an unloving husband. An unloving husband exacerbates the normal challenges to being a wife and mother. Not only does he make the challenges that are already present bigger and more significant, he also gives new challenges. And so he is the number one challenge to being a godly wife and mother that is an unloving husband. And husbands can be unloving in any number of ways. They can be selfish, thinking only of themselves, never their wife or family. They can be deadbeat fathers, failing to accept their role and responsibility as the head of the wife and the leader of the family. And they can even be abusive. This is all the result of an unloving husband. Another way they can be an unloving husband is that when they don't view their wife as the weaker vessel. So there's only one time in our marriage that I left a mark on Elizabeth. We were moving, was it a refrigerator or something? So I was moving a refrigerator, and I got her to help me. And uh, it left a big old <laughs> mark on her leg or something. So I was not treating her as a weaker vessel. I was thinking, if I can do it, she can do it. Okay? That's not good. That's not being a loving husband. And so having an unloving husband is a huge challenge to women being uh, wives and mothers. And um, a wife, well, let me put it this way. God never intended women to have unloving husbands. God intended women to have loving husbands because that marriage is to form a team. And that team are to do things together. They are to form a family. And anytime that unity between the husband and wife is challenged or disrupted, there's going to be problems. So that's the first challenge. Second challenge is the culture. 
is the culture. So our culture, as you know, challenges wives and mothers in many different ways. And I've just put two categories here, overt lies and subtle messages. We've already talked about some of the lies that our culture says. Women can do everything and anything a man can do. Women can be like men. And even women can be men. That's what it's come to now in our culture. Some of the subtle messages that women are told is that as a woman, if you are to be valued, you must minimize your femininity. In other words, you must minimize the way God created you as female. That's a subtle message that our world presents. Another message that our world presents to women is that they must maximize man's attraction to them to get ahead. Capitalize on the fact that men are attracted to women. The world gives that indication subtly through all sorts of means. Thirdly, the third subtle message that our culture tells our uh, females, our ladies, is that motherhood is less valuable to society. It is less valuable. Motherhood has hardly any value. So that's the, the second challenge is the culture. And you get all these lies and subtle messages from the culture that lead people astray. Thirdly, there's financial pressures. This is uh, very common today. You know, in the world we live in today, most households have two incomes. And so that means that our society has become geared toward households having two incomes. And so everything is given based on the fact that this household will have two incomes. So that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on ladies to have to work. They think they have to work. If we're going to have a nice home, if we're going to be able to provide for our children, so on and so forth, both of us need to work. So can I just say this? In a home where there's two incomes, you need to live on the man's income. Everything else is surplus. Do not live, do not have your needs met by two incomes. So there's financial pressure. Then there's pressure from family and friends. And unfortunately, not all of our family and not all of our friends give us good advice. Even Christian family and friends don't always give, give us good advice when it comes to how wives and mothers ought to live and ought to function. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, fifthly, churches don't address this issue. This is another challenge. Churches just don't address this issue. They ignore it. And uh, whether you agree with my understanding of Scripture or not, we're not going to avoid the issue. We're, we're going to at least put the issue out there when it comes to women, wives, and mothers and how they ought to operate, what they ought to do in their marriage and their family. The issue of women is probably one of the most dangerous issues to deal with in the church because there's so many women in the church. And churches really struggle with the role of women in the church and with the role of women even in the family. The reality when it comes to it is that most people are going to do what they want to do, regardless of what the Bible says. They will do what they want to do. You can show them chapter and verse and there will be an excuse, there will be an exception given. And when we find churches that don't teach on the roles of women, wives, and mothers, there's all sorts of excuses that people can think up in order to avoid their responsibilities. Finally, lastly, is single motherhood. 
Single motherhood is a challenge. And uh, I think I'm somewhat qualified to speak about this because from the time I was eight years old, I was raised by a single mother. And a, being a single mom can result from any number of things. Death, abandonment, divorce, poor decisions, sin. It can result from all of these things. And wherever the single motherhood came from, the results are still the same. You're left alone to raise a child. No one ever gets married thinking, one day I want to raise children by myself. Nobody ever thinks that. Okay? God has not designed a family to operate with one parent. Fathers and mothers have different but complementary roles in the family life. And so single motherhood. I mean, we could say parents, single, being a single parent, but we're not talking about parents. We're talking about mothers. Single, being a single mother can be a challenge. So what's the solutions to some of these things? What's the solutions? Real quick, I'm just going to list them here. Number one, the Holy Spirit. So if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. Okay, just like the husband, the solution to the husband's challenges, number one is the Holy Spirit. Okay, as a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's ministry in you is automatic. You have to yield to the Spirit and you have to know the Word of God. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and He leads you through the Word of God. That's how He directs you, through God's Word. But you have the Holy Spirit and you. Secondly, this is letter B, you have to submit to the Bible. You know, knowing the Bible is not enough. You have to do what it says. You have to submit to it even when it hurts. Even when it isn't what I want to do. Even when people are going to look down on me for doing it. You have to do it. You have to submit yourself to the Bible. Third solution is a loving and leading husband. Loving and leading husband. So let me just say, ladies, pre-marriage. So basically, I'm talking over here. Okay? Ladies, pre-marriage. If the guy you're interested in is not the kind of guy described in the Bible as a godly man, mark him off the list. Forget about him. Delete button. Clear the history. Doesn't have anything in your, to do with your life anymore. If a guy you're interested in is not exemplifying characteristics found in a good husband and father, you're not going to change him when you get married. He's not going to change. He's not going to all of a sudden say, oh, I'm going to be a good husband. I'm going to be a good father. Does not work that way. So ladies, look for a godly committed Christian guy from a good home where the principles of a biblical family are modeled. By the way, good guys are found at church and Bible college. Okay? Church and Bible college. If you want to find a good guy, church and Bible college is where you find good guys. Okay, I'm not saying good guys don't exist anywhere else. But if your intent is to find a good guy, you want to go where the pool's a little bit deeper. Okay? Church and Bible college. So, by the way, guys, guys who aren't married, you don't have to be a husband or father to practice the characteristics of godly husbands and fathers. You don't have to be a husband. You don't have to be a father to still practice and have the same characteristics as a godly husband and father. Uh, the fourth solution, fourth area is the church. And the church can provide help in any number of ways. First, the first way is that the church teaches what the Bible says about women, wives, and mothers. Secondly, the older women of the church need to make it their mission to teach the younger women of the church. Show interest in them and teach them. Thirdly, we find that there could be help from the leadership of the church. I'm thinking particularly of single mothers in this instant. 
But leaders of the church can provide for that husband-like leadership that everyone needs. The leadership of the church can do that. And fourthly, the men of the church, and I'm still thinking about single mothers, especially with male children, that they need to rely on the men of the church to provide a godly male role model for their male children. The fact of the matter is no single mother, no matter how good of a mother she is, no matter how of a biblical mother she is, she cannot be a male role model. And boys need male role models, good male role models. So let me wrap this up. So I realized that most of what I said this morning goes against about 100 years of cultural influence. But again, the challenge for us is not what the culture says. The challenge for us is what does the Bible say? When we study the Bible, what does it say? What does it say? When we do that, we don't look for loopholes. We don't look for exceptions. We look for what does it say? What are the principles that the Bible gives for the rule of life? And the Bible is not silent on women, wives, and mothers. Listen to it. Get your Bible out, study it, read it. Secondly, we need to be discerning. We all need to be discerning, but especially wives and mothers. You need to be discerning about what you bring into your life to have influence over your life, including who your friends are, how much you listen to family members, how much exposure you have to all sorts of media, You need to seek out and find godly influences that are going to push you to the Word of God. So you never trust anybody who always has a bright idea or a solution, but it's never connected to the Bible. Okay, that's just their opinion. You need something that's connected uh, to the Bible. Measure all things against the Bible. Don't pay attention to worldly wisdom. Just because it works, just because it's practical, just because it's effective, doesn't mean it's good. God's a God of principles. He speaks to us in principles. We need to pay attention to God's principles. And finally, this is for everybody, but especially for women, your contentment is not going to be found and being a wife or being a mother. Your contentment contentment is only going to be found in your relationship with the Lord. If you're maintaining your relationship with the Lord as you ought, you will find that in these other areas of life where you will be challenged, that you will be able to have peace and understanding in dealing with those other challenges. The basis of your life and the contentment that you have in your life must be on your relationship with the Lord, none of these other things. Would you stand with me as we close in a word of prayer? Father, we come before you and we are thankful For the women in our church, we're thankful for wives and mothers. And uh, Father, we know how much they are challenged. They have so many things that have been stacked against them, lies from the culture, um, people around them who don't live as they ought, husbands and children who struggle with their own challenges and they bring challenges to their wife and mom. And uh, Lord, we're weak and we're frail and we're faced with all this stuff we can't handle. We admit all that to you and we ask for your help. We thank you that we have the Holy Spirit who uses your word to guide and direct us in our life. Help us to follow him. Help us to get into your word, to study your word, to see what it says, not just for a quick snippet for the day, but the principles that it's teaching us. 
And Lord, as men, we want to be helpful to our wives and mothers and to the women in our church in general. Help us to be living as godly husbands and as godly fathers. And so, Lord, we know that uh, you have enabled us, you have equipped us to be obedient to your word. Help us finally to submit. None of us like to submit, but we need to submit to your word and see the blessings that it brings, even through difficulty. And so, Father, we commit the rest of our day to you as we go to Sunday school, be with our Sunday school teachers. And Lord, as we eventually leave this place, we want to be bold witnesses for Jesus Christ. We want to tell people about him and what his coming to to the earth means, what he did on the earth to provide them with hope and with salvation. Help us to do that. Help us to have courage in telling others. And we pray this in his name. Amen.